from the Empire State to the Golden Gates. This is Quad Radio USA. Now, with all the dirt from the world of ATV motocross and GNCC racing, here's Mr. 10 Seconds. Rodney Tomlin. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Quad Radio for Quad Radio Live on a Wednesday, July 25th, 2012, uh, pre-Red Bud and pre-round number nine of ATV Motocross, summer break of GNCC Racing and post the weekend of uh, exceptional fun, from what I understand, at Ashtabula. Our guest this week, Mr. Tim Farr, the legend himself, will be uh, joining us in just a couple of moments. Right now, I want to send a special shout-out to our friends at, of course, uh, a, uh, Impact Solutions, ATV.com. Impact Solutions is your Elka suspension uh, suspension headquarters here in the United States. If you need anything Elka suspension done wise here in the U.S., of course, Impact Solutions, ATV.com are going to be the ones to do it. We want to say thanks to them for uh, helping support uh, Quad Radio and Quad Radio Live. Also, uh, another reminder that I want to bring to your folks' attention is, of course, uh, uh, coming up here August 25th and uh, 26th as the 10th and final edition of the Matt Bartosik Celebration Race. Uh, that's the 10th anniversary of that, and uh, it's a celebration of a rider name of uh, Matt Bartosik who lost his life race, uh, racing uh, about 10 years ago, as a matter of fact, and uh, we've been celebrating him for the past 10 years. That final edition coming up, like we said, August 25th, 26th, that's going to be taking place, I believe it's at Maple Shade. Hold on, I've got the details right here. Maple Shade MX in Pennsylvania, actually Sugar Grove, Pennsylvania. If you log on to quadradio.com, there is a uh, banner on the side there. that will tell you a little bit more about this and uh, get you some information on that as well so you can uh, get up to date with what's going on. And uh, on a uh, Wednesday evening here in southeastern Ohio, the uh, Quad Radio Live Studios, uh, what I like to refer to as Quad Radio USA, uh, we welcome one Tim Farr who is uh, driving uh, aimlessly through the middle of Florida from what I understand. We say good evening and welcome to the legend himself, Tim Farr. Tim, welcome to Quad Radio, buddy. Hey, thanks, Rodney. It's good to be here. Yeah, man, good to have you along. I know that uh, this is something that I've been kind of working on uh, getting you involved on this for a long time. A lot of folks have said, why don't you get Tim Farr on? Why don't you get this guy on? Why don't you get that guy on? And I was like, well, I want to wait till the perfect time. And I think now is a perfect time. A lot of things going on. Uh, we're in the midway season of the GNCCs, which you are a big part of. Uh, ATV motocross, we're nearing the end of that season, which you have uh, some irons in the fire with, with uh, uh, some friends and uh, family and so forth. And then also, uh, uh, of course, uh, you just participated this past weekend in what I understand up there at Pine Lake and Ashtabula in one of the UTV races. So, uh, wow, a very busy individual for a retired man from the ATV racing industry. Yeah, I guess so. I don't think I ever really retired, to be honest. Um, still at it, still having fun, and, you know, still enjoy so many different aspects of the sport. Um, motocross, GT, the side-by-side, -side, the GNCC, everything is just, you know, it's all very interesting and all, you know, a good time for me. No doubt about that. And, and for those that don't know Tim Farr, give us a little bio. If somebody says comes up to you and says, who is Tim Farr, how would you explain to them, Tim Farr, who you are? Uh, I guess I'd have to say, you know, I, I hate to say it, but I've been around a long time. I'm one of the old guys in the sport now and you know, won a lot of championships hopefully made a good impact on a lot of people in this sport and uh, helped to get to where it is. Um, but here recently, just been still enjoying riding and, you know, manage, managing teams and working with R&D stuff suspension-wise with Elka, you know, and uh, sponsoring Brian Wolf and just trying to, trying to stay involved in the sport and enjoy it. Now, you said several championships, and when we talk about several championships, we talk about in ATV motocross and also TT, if I'm correct, right? Yeah, yeah, both for sure. And you actually even raced, used to race a little GNCC on top of all that whenever you were, uh, I guess, a premier rider in ATV motocross some. 
Yeah, I did. I really enjoyed the GNCC. It was kind of a, a way to cross train a little bit. And, uh, you know, I think I was pretty decent at it. Um, probably as good as any of the motocross guys that ever tried to do it. Uh, it was it was definitely a big difference when you went from the motocross side to GNCC. Uh, just kind of trying to figure out figure out how it's done and do it do it safely and and uh, not tear up your equipment. <laughs> but it it was uh, it was definitely a good experience. Yeah, and, 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 and you know, somebody else that's getting ready to experience something like that, and I don't know how uh, tight you are with this individual, but uh, Chad Wayne, and we had him on last week on Quad Radio Live, and he, uh, he he let the cat out of the bag that he's planning on hitting maybe the Ironman this year, and he's never done a GNCC, so it's uh, it's going to be pretty neat to see him uh, make that crossover too. Yeah, that'll be really cool for sure. Chad's a great rider, and, you know, for sure, in the past couple of years here, he's really, really come into his own. And, um, you know, he used to be, he's always been super fast, but, you know, he's really got it figured out now to the point where, you know, he, he knows how to, you know, keep his equipment under him and, and put down some really fast laps and win races. So that's what it takes. That's for sure, and uh, of course, uh, you you can recognize that. That's obviously that's obvious because uh, you're a fast guy yourself. But uh, uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, this. Well, let's just talk about things uh, in general this this year so far for you. Like I said, this past weekend you uh, participated in some UTV racing. From what I understand, I saw about a seven second clip on Facebook of you coming and doing some step up double or some double or something out there. And man, you look like you were flying and having a good time. Is all I know. Yeah, definitely. You know, we went out, and uh, my nephew actually rode with me, uh, David Fisher, which is uh, one of the Fisher family kids that, uh, you know, Fisher family owns Pine Lake, and he's ridden with me the past couple of years in the side-by-side, and, you know, we have a blast. We went out, we whole shot at the race. I think there were probably maybe 20, 25 UTVs in it, and Went out and just had a blast. There's a couple of big step up jumps in the woods that have always been there. You know, I grew up in that area and used to ride out there a little bit, but I don't think anyone ever thought you could jump them in a in a side by side. And <laughs> I always knew I could. I just, I just, <laughs> I needed the opportunity to give it a try and uh, just kind of went for it and just pretty much flat footed it and about 40, 45 mile an hour and. It, Put me right up over the top. It was pretty easy, actually. Sweet, sweet. Sounds like. Uh, so, did you, did you end up taking the win? Yeah, yeah. We had, we won. Um, we had a pretty good lead and didn't really have much trouble. We got stuck one time and got out of that. Yeah, we won it and we had a blast doing it. Now, what about the three wheeler action? I understand that there was some three wheeler racing going on uh, this weekend too. Yeah, there was, and I was really impressed at how many. People came out for that, how many riders they had. It's really, really cool. It was a cool event. It was cool to see it happen at Pine Lake with all the history there. Yeah. Um, and some pretty fast guys. You know, I didn't get to watch a lot of it, but, you know, I also raced on the track as well. Found uh, one of my KTMs, a TT bike, and had a good time doing that. But I did watch some of the three wheeler action, and guys were going good. Wow. Uh, did, 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 it, did it bring back a lot of memories, I guess, for you? Were you racing whenever the three-wheelers were out, or were you kind of in that transition period? No, I was racing. <laughs> Actually, uh, not for very long, but I did do a little bit of three-wheeler racing <laughs> um, way back then. So, And it was fun, and I actually had some offers to ride to ride a three-wheeler at this event, which I would have done if I'd had any time to actually do a little bit of riding, a little bit of practicing. Oh, I but it's, a, it's, a, it's really hard to go back to it. I mean, I think if I had a day or so to play with it a little bit, my, I might be able to do okay, but to just jump on one, I, I knew better. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine that there's a lot of differences between the three wheels and four wheels for sure. And, uh, I mean, even though, you know, it'd probably be an easier transition from three to four than four to three, I would think. <laughs> it, yeah, most definitely. 
Yeah. So um, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the the ATV motocross. What kind of irons you got in the fire over there? I know that you're pretty close with Mark Baldwin and and Josh Upperman and those guys. Uh, is is there anything more than that that you're doing over there in the ATV motocross side of things right now? Um, not really. You know, I try to keep things open. If there's opportunities there, I definitely would like to be considered for them. Um, but I do work a little bit with Josh. Mark and I talk daily about, you know, setup stuff and you know, suspension and engine engine things for Josh. But, um, you know, I, I came from motocross. I still enjoy it. I don't get a lot of time to ride, but when I do, that's, that's my first choice is to hit a motocross track. So um, it is fun to work with work with those guys. And Mark and I have a lot of history and won a lot of championships together. Wow. And I like to be able to help help him out and help Josh anytime that I can. Yeah, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that relationship you got with Mark here in just a couple of moments and where that all stems from because I've seen and heard a lot of things, and I'd like to hear some of that history myself. But uh, right now I'm uh, kind of uh, ke- keeping it up to date to 2012. Let's talk a little bit about the GNCC side of things. I know that that you've been pretty uh, pretty busy with that for the last few years. Actually, uh, you had the KTM efforts there for a while, and uh, now that that has come to pass, you've actually uh, started a, another little mini team and uh, helping out Brian Wolf. And uh, you you kind of alluded that to that just a couple moments ago. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I came in, and you know, Brian. I, I guess I didn't know for sure where I was going to be this year, uh, this season. You know, there were some different uh, different offers out there, but never really came uh, came out and worked out for me. But the KTM program was awesome, and I wish that that still was going, but, you know, how economy and budget cuts have been. So basically, uh, Brian had a program set up. It seemed like a pretty good program, and I was going to just help him a little bit on the side. I wasn't going to do any sort of a team, but just kind of help him a little bit with tuning and testing when I could because he lives fairly close to me. But something happened there, and his deal kind of fell through, and he came to me last minute to see if I could do anything to help him out, and kind of where it all started, I made some phone calls and pulled in some people that I had used for, you know, throughout my career, and and made some stuff happen. You know, we actually got hooked up with JG Off Road and and Honda, and got some got some support from the two of those companies. And uh, we've made a go of it. And it's been a little rough. I mean, <laughs> we've had we've had some. Well, we were hoping for a lot more, but it, at the same time, it was a last minute program. Um, but you know, we've kind of used the first half of the season to figure some things out and you know a lot of our problem has been uh brian's health really i mean yeah. he's, he's a great great rider and the bikes have been good the suspension has been really good the engines are phenomenal um really good package just uh that we we never would have expected to have happen what did happen which was you know the infection that that brian has had in his hand that we've been fighting against for pretty much the first half anyway, but I think we've got a handle on it and kind of our plan from here is to regroup during the break and come out strong and just try to try to win some races and not not so much focus on points or championships. I mean, that stuff's kind of out the window at this point. Right. We're just, just, you know, prove a point and try to go out and win. Yeah, and you guys have had some success, man. I mean, you guys are right there with Snowshoe. Brian led a good part of that and wasn't until probably the last three miles for the checkers, and he had some <laughs> issues there. But uh, the week before that, I think uh, he was out in out west at one of the works races, I think in Utah, and uh, from what I understand – uh, had a pretty good uh, a pretty good win over there. I'm not you know I'm not going to try to to say anything to de- you know to take anything away from the works guys, but uh, you know uh, looked like things went well for him there that day, and uh, uh, that was a good confidence boost for him. And it was also a good prove uh, a good point for your program that it is a strong program like you guys had thought and hoped it would be. Yeah, it was really good for us. It was cool to to go out there. I mean, to be honest, we we. Uh, 
I wouldn't say that it was. I mean, we made a good effort for it, but it was kind of again a last minute deal. Um, we talked about setup. I wasn't able to go out, so we kind of just we took the the race bike that we were retiring from GNCC for the year, and we were building a new one. So we took took that race bike that he'd done, you know, the the rounds up until that point on, and just made some changes. Kind of kind of took it and did more of a adjustment on the suspension, more towards a, a mix between motocross and woods, which is kind of like what works is. Um, maybe a little bit of desert in there. And, I mean, I've got a lot of experience with a lot of different types of racing, so kind of had a good idea what, what Brian would need and um, packed it up, threw it in a trailer, and Brian flew out, the bike got taken out, and, and uh, yeah, it turned out really well. Really, really well, actually, you know. We had yeah. to we had to adjust a little bit for altitude on jetting, which I, I guess I didn't realize that that was going to be an issue. I didn't I didn't know really much about didn't know very much about the location of the event, but the altitude was really high. And Brian called me and said, "Man, this thing runs really, really bad." So <laughs> anyway, we figured out that we talked to Baldwin and we got the jetting thing figured out, and the bike ran good and everything worked flawlessly and brian pretty well pretty well checked out yeah yeah that's that, that's what I, you know and brian it's funny to hear brian talk about it you know he, he's like you know he i don't think he really you know he'd hope to go out there and win and he thought you know well the possibilities might be there but uh to have the fortunates that he had happen and be able to win as by as much as what he did win i know he you know he, he's kind of a little shocked and surprised by it but he's looking forward to going back i've talked to him and a few other guys johnny gallagher who i thought was going to be on with us tonight uh, normally is but uh he was uh, avoiding my phone calls. I'm sure he's probably on hot some hot date or something tonight. But uh, he and the, yeah, and right. He, <laughs> come on, man. We got to give him some. We got to at least give some kind of hype, man. <laughs> but uh, they're talking about all going out and maybe hitting another one. I know Chris Borch is talking about it. I mean that 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 sounds like a good time for everybody for those guys. Maybe maybe we can have a big GNCC invasion of the West Coast and maybe they can have a big invasion of the East Coast sometime. Maybe we can figure out something to do like that throughout the course of the year. I think that'd be pretty neat. Yeah, that would be really cool, actually. I know, I know, Brian. Brian would be tough anytime he goes out there. I mean, I I kind of know a little bit about each types of racing, and Brian comes from a motocross background before GNCC. I used to race with him locally, and and he was always really fast. So you put that, you combine that kind of speed, motocross speed, with with the you know the experience he has in the woods now, and his speed in the woods, and his stamina and I mean that's I think anytime he goes out there for an event those guys they better be on their toes yep for sure now let's talk a little bit about on their toes man let's talk about how you uh, got to where you are and put so many people on the to on their toes over the course of time uh, Tim Farr, obviously, like I said, mentioned you're a multi-time champion, Extreme Dirt Track, or TT as it's been called uh, for so many years, ATV Motocross, and like I say, dabbled in the GNCC racing world. But uh, where where does Tim Farr come from, man? How did you even get into this great industry and great sport of ATV Motocross racing? Well, actually, you know, as a kid, we just grew up riding local gravel pits and backyard tracks and stuff like that with my next older brother. Uh, he raced amateur for years. He was one of the top eight A-class amateur riders in TT. Um, we grew up in a town where you know the Ashtabula Pine Lake National was, so that was kind of something we always look forward to seeing each year. And then as we got a little bit older, we actually started to race out there a little bit. Uh, my brother... My, my brother's name is Tommy, and he actually raced and went to school with Mark Baldwin. Mark used to do work for him and, you know, work on his engines and his bikes, and that's kind of where it all started. Um, he actually raced for quite a few years, and, and I kind of tagged along, and then eventually um, he decided to go other ways, had some injuries, and said, man, I don't know. You know, I don't know about all this. It's seems like every time I make some headway, I seem to get hurt and uh, step back. So um, he kind of 
kind of pulled away a little bit and focused more on career and family and stuff like that. And and I kind of slid in and started working with Mark a lot more and kind of just all took off. I mean, we raced raced a lot of TT before we did any motocross, but um, I got enough interest from people helping me out in TT and seeing that I had potential that that I. Uh, Motocross was kind of the next logical step, and I guess as soon as I sort of went in that direction, I was pretty good at it and had, you know, kind of had a good a good run for a long time. Yeah, you sure did, and you raced against the legends of the sport, man. I mean, you guys literally, uh, I, I, I would say, helped shape and mold the ATV motocross uh, and, and TT racing uh, industry the way that it is today. Um, I mean, it's amazing. I mean, guys like you, you raced with Shane Hitt, uh, Gary Denton, Doug Gust. Uh, I mean, the list goes on. Names that I, I probably can't even recognize at this particular point in time or even know at this time. But, I mean, all the greats you basically raced with, huh? Yeah, definitely. Um, all the people that you look back at and, and as the pioneers and people that helped help build the sport, at least in, in the uh, four-wheel ATV side. You know, you, mm -hmm. before that, you had Jimmy White, you know, some of the legends from three-wheelers, Jimmy mm -hmm. White, Marty Hart, Mike Coe, those guys. And those were the guys that I looked up to growing up. You know, I was reading the magazine, wanted to be just like them. And and kind of, I guess, when I got to that point, you know, those guys were pretty well done. But, uh, you know, I still talk to Jimmy White regularly and, pretty cool to be buddies with a guy that you, you know, looked up to your whole life, and, and, uh, uh it's, it's amazing, and, you know, myself, Doug, Shane, Gary, we raced so many years, there wasn't money in the sport, there wasn't, there wasn't anything but just the pure love of it, and, you know, we raced to, we raced to race, we were competitive, and we worked hard at it, and it, it wasn't about a paycheck, it was about, being there and doing what we love to do and you know really i mean i know a lot of people look at it now and this is a good thing that i think that you can give some advice to some of these guys that are up and coming right now and that maybe are there right now and trying to get it all sorted out and figured out uh, you have made some money racing atvs over the years have you or have you not i think we might have lost tim tim you still there <laughs> I think we have lost Tim. Yep, we lost Tim there for just a moment. But anyway, we'll try to get Tim back on the uh, line here in just a second. But uh, where I'm kind of going with this right now is, uh, you know, uh, trying to uh, uh, talk about where things have come from and, and how he went from an industry that uh, basically made no money to making money is uh, kind of what we're in the process of doing right there. And I hope that this is Tim who I'm calling back right now. That's for sure. Yeah. See if we can get him, and um, if not, then uh, a couple of things we can remind hey, you. Hey, Rodney. Hey, Tim. How you doing, man? Sorry about that. Uh, I guess one of us must have dropped service there for just a split second. You yeah, no there? problem. Seems like it's pretty. Yeah, I'm good now. Okay. Uh, but what I was saying is uh, you, you talked about uh, making money. Now, you yourself, uh, back whenever you did it, it was for the love of the sport, and there wasn't any money in it, but you have made money over time, correct? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, the last, oh, gosh, five, six years that I was racing full-time, I did very well. Right. And now it was, it was really good to me. I, I have no complaints. I mean, the sport's been great to me. The industry's been great to me. Um, yeah, phenomenal. Now, I, I, it, would you look, if you looked at, at the situation now, the industry, and I know that you, whenever you... Uh, were racing back in the mid 80s early 90s and and things of that nature uh, mid 90s there was uh, you guys had a lot of complications number one because you didn't have any factory support really after after the whole debacle in the mid 80s there and you guys had to build an industry all on your own and uh, that was tough to do I know you kept the industry alive you, you made the racing alive but if you looked at it now apples to apples by comparison 
what is the state of the economy in racing as opposed to what it was whenever you first got into it and did it just simply for the love of it? I would have to say it's still at this point, even though the economy isn't so good and, you know, a lot of a lot of companies have pulled out early, stepped back. It's still much, much better than it was through, I guess I would have to say more through the, through the 90s. I mean, I basically started late 80s and ran through the 90s and then um, a little past halfway, I'd say around 2000 seven or eight was when I was really kind of stepping back from it. But, yeah, the economy has been rough lately, but we came from a time when there were not even production ATVs. You know, the sport was the sport was uh, supported and, and built around the aftermarket companies. And they, they, you know, the riders and the companies were what kept the sport alive. And, and I think we're going to see a little bit of that come back and you're going to see, you're really going to see, at least for a while, I think, you're going to see the, the true grip behind the sport. You're going to see the people that are there because, you know, they want to race and they they want to be the best. And it's not completely just because they've seen guys like me or Doug or, you know, do very well towards the end of our careers. I mean, I think it's going to be more about, you know, true grid and actually, and actually racing. Right. Yeah, and, and that's what, and I think that makes and produces probably some of the best racing, honestly, and probably makes for a better series. But uh, at the same time, you know, it, it makes it a little tough not to make money. Now, you, you, we look at today's pro class. What's going on out there right now, Tim? I mean. The pro purse now, as far as you look at the pro races, you know, I, I don't think that the pro purse has ever been much of a factor. I mean, you don't get real rich from the pro purse, but, you know, you can make a little bit of money off of it and stuff. What, what is the holdup? Why are we only seeing 13, 14 pro riders on the pro road, whether it be in GNCC or ATV motocross or, or anything where the pros in ATV seem to be lacking right now? What do, you, what do you think the big thing is there? Do you think it's the money? Do you think it's about the money once those guys reach that point that they, they feel that they should be making that much? Or does it cost that much more to participate at that level? You know, I don't think that it costs that much more at that level. I think it's about I think it's about commitment. It really is you know, guys like Chad and Upperman and Brown and Natalie and those guys. I mean, I think you you would have to agree that in this sport you seem to have riders peak at a later age maybe mm -hmm. than in motocross and and stay longer than you see see them at the top in motorcycles. Mm-hmm. And I think that I think that's great, and at the same time, it can be a bit discouraging to up and coming riders. I mean, you'll see a lot of guys come out of pro am or or up to the a class ranks and and uh try to go head to head and really build a lot of steam and kind of run into a brick wall and there's there's four or five guys that have been there for a long time and are still pretty untouchable. I think you look at it from that point of view it it holds back a lot of younger riders from moving up. And, you know, expense is always going to be an issue. Um, sponsorship, for sure, you know, with the economy and the, and the industry kind of pulling back. But I do think that, you know, you, you look right now at a guy like Natalie, and he's been there for a long time. John and I raced against each other for many, many years, and, you know, for championships, and and he's still there. Um, you get companies that come in and they support the riders that have been there for a long time and have been tough. It doesn't make a lot of room for others. So I don't know really what the answer is, but definitely, definitely the sport needs to be built, I think, more up from the amateur level. Mm-hmm. You know, in motorcycles, you have an amateur series, you have a pro series. 
we don't have the kind of numbers or the structure to do that at this point, but I think eventually that's the direction it needs to go in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I don't disagree with you there a bit. I, 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 I see exactly what you're talking about. And, you know, I think that's kind of we, – we're rather unique. I mean, there's not very many series that you see out there where you have full-on amateur racing and full-on professional racing in the same weekend, on the same track, at the same time. I mean, that, that, that's something rather unique in and of itself right there. And, uh, you know, it, it makes it, it, it – I guess it, it's good in some ways and it, it's bad in others because, you know, these guys, you know, week after week they're looking out there and, you know, they're, they're seeing that, uh, you know, there's 14 or 15 guys on the, on the pro line and there's, you know, 600 amateur riders out there, you know. Obviously, we've got the riders that could fill that pro line, but – the riders aren't filling up, but you, 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 I guess you could deduce it down more, more so less than finances would just be the level of competition. Then, I mean, just to reach that top five, like you're talking about that, that makes it tough and rather discouraging, I guess is kind of what you're saying. Yeah, I think so. You know, I've, I've been around it a long time. I mean, you can look at the numbers of championships out of single riders, you know, Bill Balance, Chris Boric, you had Gary Denton, you know, I won a lot of championships. You don't see it as much in the motocross side, but in GNCC, there's some very, very dominant people. Yep. Yeah, I guess that would be very discouraging. Now, what what kind of advice can you give to, say, a parent that is bringing a child up through and the child's got aspirations and dreams of wanting to be a Tim Farr, a John Natale, a Doug Gust, a Chad Weenan, a Bill Balance, a Chris Boric, you know, what kind of advice can you give those folks? I mean, because, like like you say, I mean, it can be pretty discouraging. How how can you go about, I guess, how can they keep from being discouraged as they build themselves into that elite individual that they're trying to work toward? You know, I think the key to it is, I mean, it takes a lot of work, and you've got to be ready to commit to that. And the parents have to be there to, to support it and not push too hard, but, you know, still make it fun. I think you see a lot of riders come up through and they get way too serious way too quickly and maybe maybe a little bit too much unneeded pressure from the parents. And, and it takes away a lot. You know, my parents were always there for me, but they didn't push on me. They knew if I wanted to do it and I wanted to be successful that I would do it. And, you know, I, I, I respect them for that. Uh, I've seen it happen the other way way too often and you know i mean the more have more fun you're having the better you're gonna you're gonna run you're gonna ride and it's also going to be the better that you treat your sponsors and just your whole image is going to be better in general for sure on that now now speaking of sponsors let's talk a little bit about that the sponsorship I'm sure the dollars are a little more limited now than what they were in the last few years, and probably the sponsors are limited as well. And this is we we've reached a point I think in the ATV racing community that we need to. And this is my opinion. And correct me if I'm wrong. And you've been down this road and you know about it. But I mean, we need to start looking other places than the actual industry ourselves itself. I believe. I, is it about tapped out as far as as that goes? I mean, do what 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 can these people do to start making money and building these programs? Yeah, definitely we need to see some activity from outside of the industry. The industry is very tapped. I mean, I think you're, I don't know how much, I don't think you're going to see them pull back much more what is there, but it's just not enough to go around when you have up-and-coming riders that, that, that could possibly really make a mark. You know, you, you only have so much from each sponsor, sponsor each OEM. You know, I, it's, it's great to have still what we do have, but there's really not much more to go around. So we're at a point where, you know, the marketing side of it has to... And I think that's, you know, I think broad, that's where we... Broad now. Yeah, and I think that's where we all kind of falter there. You and I have talked about this before, Tim. Actually, just within the last week or so, I think about about the market, you know, and going out. It's it's not easy 
to work within the market. And it's even harder to work once you go outside the realm of where we're at. Uh, because, you know, especially for an individual, you go calling on somebody like Pepsi Cola or you go calling on somebody like whoever, uh, you know, it's tough to, number one, know who you're going to call. And number two, know what to present them with. So what kind of steps do you think a person could take that might benefit them in maybe helping them be around a little longer financially? Would, would, would uh, well, an agent would an agent be something good? And I mean, would you get an in, inside the industry agent, an outside the industry agent? I mean, how? What, in your opinion, what do you think being around for so long? Well, I think uh, that's a tough one, really. I think that you probably have to look. Uh, my guess would be to look outside the industry for an agent, something different, something that hasn't been done yet. Um. Now, have you yeah, dealt there are with an a lot agent? Of, a lot of, yeah, I have dealt with an agent in the past and with some success, but for the most part, my racing, we didn't have as good a television coverage. We didn't have, well, uh, for a lot of years, any, but that, that opens up a lot, and that's where, you know, we need to capitalize on that. Right. Outside of the, outside of the industry. And it's just it's it's a tough point, but I mean it does have it does have to happen, and soon. I mean, basically, I do think that the the series themselves need need to go outside of the industry as much as possible, and I, I know that that's for sure a goal. Right. And it's just a matter of uh, you know making it happen. I know that that there's definitely interest and and that they do push to make that kind of stuff happen, but. It's just timing. I mean, I think eventually it will come together. I agree. I agree. Now, what working with an agent, what can people expect them if, say, you've got an, an up-and-comer B or an A rider or something, and you're thinking about maybe getting an agent or maybe even a pro-am rider and a, or a pro rider, you're thinking about getting an agent. What kind of things can they expect out of an agent? I mean, are, are there upfront fees? Are they? Are they? Do they work just on solely on commission? I mean, uh, is it, it's? I'm sure it's an investment, right? Yeah, it's an investment, and I would think, you know, your your B A riders, that's going to be more of an upfront investment. There's really no, at that point in your career. I mean, you're, it'd be good to start, but you're going to have to spend some money to cover, you know, cover someone like that versus at the pro level. You know, if things are going right, if you're a top pro, you know, your your manager or your agent should be able to work on commission. Um, being that at the pro level, you should be making money and there should be potential to make money. So, basically, uh, that would be the difference, just being between amateur and pro, on um, what you could expect that an agent would ask for. Right, right. And uh, um, where could a person find an agent? I mean, w would you even have a clue where, where somebody could even start? I mean, I guess the the Internet right now is something that you didn't have years ago, so there's probably more tools out there to utilize now than there were whenever you were doing it. Yeah, definitely. When I was doing it, it was basically, you know, I was, yeah, I was pretty well known in the industry, so I knew, I knew the guys, people knew me, and... I'd had different agents approach me, and I kind of went about, you know, the ones that I thought were the best and, and and had good success. But the Internet is amazing. You know, I mean, it just opens up the entire world and, you know, in two seconds. So it, it's definitely where you need to go. It's spend some time sending emails and making phone calls and use every resource that you have to to get to that point and learn about the people and you know like I said before and, and I think you agree that it's kind of at a point where you know we've got to find some help outside of the industry mm -hmm. and you know within the series the the riders the the managers pretty much everything I mean it's it's uh 
it's not that big of an industry, and it's pretty well tapped out. Yep, it sure is. It most definitely is. But one thing that, that, that somebody can do, too, and it doesn't cost any money to do, is self-promotion. I mean, you, you, you utilizing the tools that we have with the Internet and everything, web pages, Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, and beyond that stuff and updating it constantly and being in people's face as much as possible, I think is another good thing. And, and you can do that and it not cost you anything. And, and I already see a lot of people are doing that. Yeah, that's a that's a great resource. I mean, that's something that we never had, and it's it's huge. I mean, it goes everywhere. Uh, it's it's so cool. It's so cool to to be able to follow follow your favorite rider or the series or you know whatever. I mean, you know pretty much inside and out what's going on yep. at any given time, and I mean, people love that. So that's a that's a huge tool and. The more that riders and teams and sponsors, I mean, pretty much throughout the entire you know, entity of the of the industry, that's just, I mean, it's it's priceless. Yep. Well, Tim, I know you you got went a uh, dinner that you got to get to, and I told you it'd be only fifteen or twenty minutes would be on here. I lied, by the way. <laughs> but uh, a couple of quick questions before we do let you go, and and I do appreciate your insight on that. I, I hope that folks have have gotten a little bit out of that, and maybe can take something from this and and use it as a positive spin in their life and in their careers and things. But uh, speaking of careers, looking back on yours right now, man, what are what are some of the highlights i mean as you look back on it what is probably one of the most memorable things that you can uh, that you can think of throughout your entire atv racing career oh man there's a bunch but actually i would have to say when i signed to, you know, most memorable when i signed my factory contract with american honda and helped launch and do the r d for the the TRX 450R, 2003, I signed for the 04 season, and that was amazing. Uh, I then, shortly after I signed, raced and won the Baja 1000 with Honda. Um, there's so many different things, championships, but I think that was such a turning point for the entire industry because Honda is such a strong company and has such a big presence that I think, I guess I know, that many of the other manufacturers follow what Honda does. And I actually had offers from other companies that were the OEs that were that were great offers and great companies. And I kind of knew, I mean, I was always a, a Honda guy. I mean, I, I loved Hondas, but at the same time, some of the bikes that I'd ridden and some of the support I'd gotten from some of the other companies at the time was really, really good and was very tempting, but I felt like the Honda move would help to elevate the sport. I felt that if we did this and we made the big splash that we were talking about doing um, with Honda, that hopefully it would it would motivate the other companies to do the same. And it kind of worked for the, for a while there. <laughs> yeah, it worked for actually worked for quite a long time. It was really good, and I think it I think it opened up a lot of doors that have been closed for a long time. I just hope I hope those doors can be opened again. But the one thing that we got to remember, you look at any major racing series, and you can tell that uh, well NASCAR, as a matter of fact, you know it isn't Ford, Chevy, Toyota, and all that that supports that industry. And uh, even in the motocross industry and supercross industry now, you're starting to see that it's not the Hondas, the Suzukis, the Yamahas that's supporting that industry. It's uh, everybody else, the, um, the uh, I guess you could say, manu um, uh, industry manufacturers as well as outside the industry. So uh, that's one thing that we got to get away from as much and as great as it is for those uh, factory deals. Those are going away. It's a matter of uh, building your own teams and uh, kind of like what uh, you're spearheading right now. And I think that's pretty neat because I, I don't think people realize, maybe they do, they saw what you did with the GNCC side of things and what you're, and probably don't know what you're trying to do in, in, in the whole realm of things, both GNCC and ATB Motor across but uh, I, I know that you got some irons in the fire and you're hoping to get some things worked up in the future and 
I wish you good luck with that kind of stuff, and uh, that's for sure. I know you got some uh, obstacles to uh, climb, but if anybody can make it happen, Tim, I, I know that you can, man. <laughs> yep, I'm going to keep plugging away, and uh, hopefully we'll get this back to where where it needs to be, and um, things will be good again. Yep. All right, one other question, and then I'll let you go. I promise you. What's the most memorable race you had? And who was it against? The most memorable race would have to be 1995 against Gary Denton for my first championship in the pro class. He had won it for, I don't even know, eight years, ten years prior to that. And it came down to he and I and Doug Gust for the championship. Unfortunately, Doug got hurt at the last race, um, so it was just Gary and I, and I had to basically beat him straight up in the motocross at Loretta Lens, and I did it and won the championship. Wow. And that's a pretty cool place to have that special memory, too, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely the the best place. No doubt. Well, Tim, again, I just want to say thanks for being on tonight, and I apologize for keeping you on so long. You're, yeah, I could probably hear your belly growling in the background, either that or, <laughs> or, or the wife's growling at you to hurry up. I don't know which it is, <laughs> but uh, really appreciate. Uh, I got, yep, just have a couple of buddies with some cold beers waiting for me. There you go. Well, I'll, we'll let you go, bud, and uh, take care of that. And again, thanks for everything, and we'll see you. Uh, are you coming to Red Bud this weekend? Uh, no, I can't actually. Uh, Josh Kirkland's wedding is this weekend, so oh, the- I won't be a red bud. So, going to have a good time at that. Yeah, well, tell Josh I said hello and wish he and his uh, new missus all the luck in the world. I hope that uh, things go well for them. And, and again, thanks to you. Uh, safe journeys for you, and we will see you soon, brother. Okay, thanks, Rodney. Have a good You do the same. That's Tim Farr here on Quad Radio Live. And as we wrap things up, a couple of things. Again, I want to say thanks again to our friends at Impact Solutions, Impact Solutions, uh, ATV.com on the World Wide Web. They're located out of Marietta, Ohio, actually. And if you go on the quadradio.com webpage, you'll be able to find out uh, more about your factory authorized Elka Suspension Service Center located right here in the U.S. And again, thanks to those folks. Uh, Don't forget, coming up August 25th and 26th, the 10th and final edition of the Matt Bartosik uh, uh, Celebration Race. And uh, that'll be taking place then. And all the details you can find out, I believe, on Facebook, which can be linked from the uh, Quad Radio page there on the uh, side where the uh, uh, actual Matt Bartosik uh, banner is located. And that'll be taking place in Sugar Grove, PA. So uh, try to make sure you head on up there. This coming weekend, we'll be at Red Bud for ATV Motocross Racing. I will be there along with the AMA ATV Motocross folks. And uh, we are going to be uh, looking to see whether or not John Natale can strike back. Uh, Josh Creamer will be back in the house as uh, his, for his second appearance in the 2012 season and see if he can't play some kind of spoiler, maybe uh, – win a couple of motos and take an overall win. I know that's what he's going to be gunning to do. Uh, Josh Upperman, uh, Thomas Brown, uh, all the guys are going to be going at it. Cody uh, uh, Gibson's got that $100 ATV Insider or ATVunderground.com uh, bounty on his head. If somebody can take him down, it's going to be a rough track, and I know those guys are going to be uh, trying to make it happen. So that'll be exciting on that end. And as always, great amateur racing there at the uh, Red Bud uh, race, round nine. And then two weeks from uh, this weekend, we'll be at Loretta Lens at the Dude Ranch in Hurricane Mills, Tennessee, as we'll wrap up the 2012 AMA ATV Motocross Championship racing season there. We'll have a couple more shows in the in the, in the the meantime, obviously, but uh, maybe we might try to get a live show from down at, at Loretta Lens on Friday night or something along those lines. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we get a little closer. But uh, nonetheless, it looks like it's going to be a... Uh, Great couple of weeks coming up, and uh, we'll be uh, talking a little more GNCC ATV racing coming up uh, pretty soon. We're on the summer break with that, but uh, we'll have more on that and uh, any other details that we can get. We'll be back live if everything goes well next Wednesday night. I know I'll be at Hurricane Mills, Tennessee. 
uh, with the uh, two-wheel motorcycle national for the amateurs, and we'll see if we can't get a, a live broadcast from down there. If not, we will definitely return uh, the following week, and we'll have uh, all the information uh, leading up to the uh, final round of ATV motocross and maybe even a couple of special guests from down there. So uh, with that, it's been a great night uh, for uh, Tim Farr. I'm Rodney Tomlin. This is Quad Radio Live.